Animal Crossing New Horizons just released not too long ago, and it's honestly got me thinking. Animal Crossing has come quite a long ways. I mean, we came from being a drifter with only a few bells to their name, to becoming mayor, to now basically becoming a god. We start off on Ground Zero again though, as we basically buy into a timeshare scan from Tom Nook. And the next thing we know, we're whisked off to a deserted island where we spend the rest of our days. But while I'm obviously pumped to play this one for a long time, I can't help but think back to the humble beginning of the series. And that's why in this video, we're going to be giving the original Animal Crossing the old swanky box treatment. So join me for some out of bounds fun, some strange documentation, and a whole lot of other weird things we'll be covering. We're going to the bizarre depths of Animal Crossing. And I brought along Miss Fushi along for the ride. She creates a lot of content focused on Animal Crossing, so I thought she'd be a perfect fit for this video. And without further ado, let's get started. I'm sure I'm not the only one who did this as a kid, but I'm certainly guilty of altering time within the game. The clock in Animal Crossing is initially influenced by the GameCube's internal clock. Many of us figured this out early on, and after playing the game for a while, we realized that certain instances during the year means people in our town send us free stuff. And who doesn't like free stuff? So I did what all my friends did. I changed my GameCube's clock to the max year and booted up my town, only to be greeted by a tsunami of gifts. Honestly, it was overwhelming. Now, this in itself is cool, but what I really want to touch on is how Animal Crossing as a game only has a timeline that lasts 30 years. While the game came out in late 2001 in Japan, on the GameCube at least, most of us didn't get to pick it up until September of 2002 in the United States. However, by that point, Animal Crossing's inner clock was already ticking. Because despite us changing our GameCube clocks to the year 2099, Animal Crossing caps out at 2030. Going the opposite way, even if we mess with a GameCube, to load an unattainable year like 1980, Animal Crossing will still stop at January 1st, 2001. It's kind of neat for a lot of reasons, because it means probably the least played time period for anyone within Animal Crossing is the year 2001. The Japanese version of the game for the Nintendo 64 came out in April of 2001, but those first four months of the year are still no man's land unless you mess with your system, because the game came out after that point, and there was no real benefit to going back in time. We simply started our towns in our current year. Now, I'm a pretty sentimental guy, so thinking that Animal Crossing's end is coming in less than 10 years is kind of bizarre. After New Year's in 2030, the year 2030 simply repeats over and over again. For some reason, that makes me pretty sad. Obviously, there's no way anyone could probably play the game for that entire time span, but it kind of dampens any sort of New Year's celebration that could occur. 2030 becomes a year-long Groundhog's Day. All aboard. Captain is a fellow that will take you over to an island just south of town in Animal Crossing, assuming you have a Game Boy Advance hooked up to your system. I never could do this as a kid when I was super into the first Animal Crossing, so I missed out on this place for a while. You get to name your island when you first make your way over to it. Regardless of what season it is, you'll arrive on a warm summertime island, and this is one of the greatest appeals of it. It's always warm here, and can contrast the winter woes of the colder months. But the thing is, this actually isn't 100% true. Animal Island actually does reflect whatever season it currently is. It's just that during the boat ride with Captain, the game loads in the summer theme for the island. Because the player always has to take the boat between the island and the mainland, the seasons are always swapped out during the voyage. However, if we break out of bounds and walk across the water, we'll notice that the island isn't always summer. It's covered in snow just like every other place during winter, and the contrast is really, really strange. You have all these tropical things sprouting out of the ground like the coconuts and the palm trees, yet it's a winter wonderland. It's kind of neat to know that this area's weather is defined by the boat ride over there. So most players know that Animal Crossing's map is laid on a grid. When your player crosses over from one square to the next, the camera pans and the next area loads. Honestly, it's pretty similar to how Luigi's Mansion's grid system works in my opinion. The only difference is that Animal Crossing's can be glitched sometimes if you mess with it enough. This will cause objects to load in as transparent, and you won't be able to see them until you initiate a reload of that same specific square. For the entire game, we're confined to this small grid, but I always wanted to see more. I wanted to see what the greater world was like beyond the confines of our small area. 
With some exploits, we can actually break out of the boundaries of our world and explore a little deeper. For starters, we're capable of exploring the train tracks. Both lead into tunnels that carry on past the entrance for quite a ways. Our player begins to walk out into the black void, but the collision and walls to the tunnel are still there. Heading up north, I was always fascinated with the stream that was beyond the railroad system. You definitely become fixated on strange things when you spent months confined to the same area. If we enter the water, we're actually free to move around it and follow it up north. It actually comes around a small bend and then disappears into a cliffside. What's neat is that I've actually had a fish spawn way up here before. Wasn't able to catch it to see what it was, but I was caught off guard when I saw its shadow swirling around. Alongside the edges of the map are actually super high walls that we can't get over. Trying to load the character onto them actually moves them insanely high into the air, and the camera simply calls out everything into a black void. However, there are some areas of the map that we can't explore past the edges. For starters, the bottom right corner of the map actually has a complete textureless area that can be walked on. It's above the edges of the cliff, and the edges of the ocean are down below it. Beyond that, the ocean actually extends out quite a ways. There's plenty of areas in it that we don't actually see since Cap'n doesn't take us out that way on the boat. The grid system's camera tracking doesn't break in any of these areas either. So, it's pretty neat to truly fill out the edges of the world. Heading back over to Animal Island, there's one thing I wanted to touch on again. During the boat ride over to the island and back from it, there are a few things that can happen. For starters, trying to catch a ride with Cap'n when there is no actual town to go back to is quite interesting. You start off in your journey as usual until Cap'n has an existential crisis and just decides he's not going to paddle. The boat drifts away from the dock for a bit as your character just stares with a this is fine type expression as the game just crashes. Silly game breaks aside, when you're on a normal boat ride, there's always something I wanted to know. Are you able to catch the fish that pass by on your way down? There are fish that sit idly by in the ocean that Captain normally rows past, but these aren't the only fish in the ocean. There's actually a few different ones located in areas that Captain will never row out to. The map for the ocean is actually pretty big and it spans several grid spaces. Out in the middle of the ocean where the player would never venture are just fish chilling. Whether through a glitch or an exploit, if our character gains access to the water on foot, but this also allows us to equip a fishing rod too, so I figured I'd try seeing if these fish could actually be caught. But regardless of what I did, the fish would not bite. Given that these fish are frozen in place and never disappear, I imagine they are just textures of the fish and aren't actually tied to an actual fish object, so they can't interact with the fishing rod. Kind of a bummer, but I guess it makes sense since the player would never be out here anyways. Apparently there's a rare chance for a whale to spawn beneath Captain's boat too, but I've personally never had it occur for me. The ocean is a mysterious place. I think most of us in Animal Crossing are accustomed to the idea of visiting another town. We hitch a train ride over and we can check out someone else's area. It was a lot of fun and a pretty neat concept, even if it was localized and only doable by memory cards at the time. But what's interesting is that there are lots of parallel worlds alongside the instance town we were able to explore. In the game files, there are tons of test maps and debug areas that game developers use to test out characters and objects. The land in these areas is often really strange and doesn't make sense. Sometimes you'll stumble upon maps full up to the brim of apples, and in others you'll find entire areas filled with pitfalls to test out how the falling animation played on different slope angles with the ground. Ammo hopping around to different test maps is cool and all, there's actually something really neat about the concept. Regardless of where you are in the test worlds, your save file will still be referenced. I find this super interesting because even event sequences, like Tom Nook's series of tasks for you, still hold true in these test maps. The items you pick up and decisions you make here can affect your main game. One of these maps has like three shops for Tom Nook and some floating squares you can climb on. It's pretty trippy. I remember going into one during my first day on the job and getting scolded that I didn't mail someone the letter I was supposed to yet. To make things even more bizarre, this loading function can be utilized on the title screen too as a way to body snatch the auto-generated characters. You force them to load onto a test map and then we can really have some fun. One of these test maps in particular have the top left house loaded as a tile. And the nice thing about the title screen characters are that they own this house by default. This means we have access to the mailbox and their memory card save function. Checking their mailbox reveals a ton of very strange letters that are kind of creepy. The game is also at the very start, despite us fully owning our house. If you save and quit, our data is saved to the memory card slot. But when we try to reload it, unfortunately KK tells us that our town data is corrupted and we need to delete it. 
To fix this, instead of saving our data, we start the saving process and then abandon it halfway through. For example, if you try to save over existing data that isn't the title screen character, the game won't let you do it and will prompt you to continue playing. This action allows us to now exit the house, forcing the game to load the town map for our title screen character. But there's a major problem with this. Since we didn't create our character or town, the game never auto-generated us a town to enter. So the game loads us into a black void that goes on forever. We even step out of a house that doesn't exist. We are free to go wherever we want and the map never ends. The grid still exists, but if we check out the in-game map, we can see that the positioning system glitches out. Boundaries were never set. I ran about 20 areas west and still encountered nothing. It's truly purgatory and there's nothing we can do. I hope you enjoyed all these Animal Crossing oddities. Before signing off, I want to thank Miss Fushi for helping out with this video. I highly recommend checking out her channel, as she's covering a multitude of Animal Crossing things over there and diving straight into everything about New Horizons. If you have a moment, swing on over to her channel right now and say hello. You can find a link to her channel in the description below and at the end of this video. And with that, thanks for watching guys and gals, and until my next video, cheers.